to introduce our featured speaker. Walter? Thank you, Julie. Can you hear me? Yes, hear you great. Thank great. you. Great. Hello, everyone. It is an honor to introduce a transformative leader from humble beginnings who inspires others to inspire themselves. A noted public educator, Clark Kerr, who served as the 12th president of the University of California, Berkeley, in his book wrote that a university president is expected to be a friend of the students, a colleague of the faculty, a good fellow with the alumni, a sound administrator with the trustees, a devotee of opera and football equally, a decent human being. And I can say Dr. Bentaputi is all of these things and more. She has been with uh, the University of Louisville. She started April 5th, May 15th, 2018 as the 18th president of the University of Louisville. She has a PhD in marketing from the University of Kansas. And as a professor, she specializes in the study of consumer behavior in a service context. She has been published in top journals like the Harvard Business Review, the Journal of Marketing, the Journal of Academic Medicine, and has been featured in popular media outlets uh, such as the New York Times, CNBC, CNN, C MSNBC, and the Fox News Network. Her vision is to that the university pursues excellence in its goal to become a premier anti-racist metropolitan research university that celebrates diversity, fosters equity, and strives to achieve inclusion. In our conversation yesterday before this, uh, before this introduction and before her talk, she did share with me that she is a Rotarian of Can the Kansas Rot Rotary Club, and she is also an honorary member of our club as part of Louisville's President's Circle. Her first scholarship was received in India by the India Rotary Club. She, they gave her 200 rupees as a scholarship. That was her first experience with the Rotary Club. They also helped her father come to the United States in 1969. So she has a lot of history with the club, with Rotary. She was born 8,500 miles from Louisville in Visakhapatnam, India, which is across the Bay of Bengal from Myanmar. She works uh, daily to update a gratitude journal that she keeps. She reads and paints, and writes poetry, and she's also a prolific fundraiser. And the things that she told me you can't see that she would like us to know is that she married her husband within three months of seeing him. She also learned how to ride horses, which was very unusual in South India because it's a very conservative country at the time and girls weren't allowed to do that. And she's also an excellent crossword puzzler. So without further ado, Dr. Bentaputi. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, it is such a joy for me to be here with you. Walter, thank you for that very kind introduction. And I have to tell you all that, yes, the Rotary Club has been a big part of my life. I wonder how many people will be able to say three generations of their family were impacted by Rotary. Because what I forgot to tell Walter yesterday is that my daughter, won the Rotary four-way test as a speaker in Ohio. And I have to tell you, converting dollars and rupees, she got a much better deal out of this. And, um, but if you come to my office, I'm working from home today, but if you were to come to my office in Grammeyer Hall, you will see proudly displayed service above self. That was a, um, uh, a, a gift to me, uh, hand printed by a fellow Rotarian. So thank you. And some of you may remember, no reason you should, but that within my, kind of like my first 100 days on the job, I joined you all uh, in uh, 2018. And at the time I was talking to you about my philosophy of service, how all of my research, when people think marketing, they will only think about the branding and the external aspect, which of course are very important, but how I've dedicated my professional uh, talents and research into how do you serve without being servile and how do you instill that spirit of service. So thank you. I'm also um, uh, really grateful because the current motto of Rotary Opens Opportunities has been true for me 
And I'm very excited that uh, the coming year, uh, Road for International's president uh, comes from India. And Shekhar Mehta says, the theme, the motto will be serve to change lives. I love that because when you serve, you don't just change the lives of others, you change your own life for the better. So that's it. Thank you for my rotary moment. You just took me down memory lane, Walter. Thank you for that. I was asked to speak to you a little bit about leading in a time of crisis. And I'd love to do that. I want to make sure that um, either President Schmidt or Walter Woods, somebody stop me in about 15 minutes so that we have plenty of time for questions. Now, I am a professor. If you have no questions, I'm ready with my two hour lecture, but I will enjoy it a great deal more. And I hope you will too. I'm sorry, can everybody hear me okay? All right, wonderful. It's just a Zoom moment, nothing to worry about. These things happen. All right, uh, first of all, I thought I would talk to you about my two and a half years here as president of UFL and what has happened in this time frame. I maybe will start with a pop quiz. The good news is that I won't put you on the spot. You don't have to call out an answer, but I want you to play along in your mind. I do know that my boss, my board chair, Mary Nixon is on the call and certainly President's Council's members. I saw Neville Blakemore, Henry Heiser, several others. So you are not allowed to cheat. I know you know the answers. How many universities and colleges do you think there are in the entire United States? Okay, so ask yourselves that question. And if you said, oh, about 5,000, you would be right. There's a lot of colleges and universities in this country. And many of you do follow athletics. So you get it when we say D1, D2, D3 in athletics as the scale at which you play. What you may not know is that the same type of evaluation happens on research. Universities are classified as R1, R2, R3, et cetera. And of the thousands of colleges and universities in this country and Canada, we count that, there's only about 130 now that are R1 universities. And now, so keep that in mind, University of Louisville, your university of Louisville is one of 130 across the country and uh, Canada. And then we also evaluate universities based on how community engaged they are. And if you were to draw a Venn diagram, they do not call it C1, C2, but think of it the same way, how community engaged you are. So if you were to draw, draw a Venn diagram of the top research universities that are also very highly community engaged, you will find that the University of Louisville is one of about 69, that's it, of the 5,000 or so universities and colleges, we're one of 69 that is at the highest level of research and highest level of community engagement. So I knew that I was going to be, no matter how long anybody is at any role, that I was for now a grateful steward of a great institution. So that's the bones of this university. It's a remarkable university. I will say one more thing to you, and then I'll tell you the progress we've made and talk about leadership. The other remarkable thing is that when you talk about R1 universities, I've told you there's about 130 of those, uh, and you look at the Pell Grant eligibles population. For those of you who may not recall, Pell Grant is, think of it as free or reduced lunch at schools, people who are at the bottom of the economic pyramid. For a typical R1, that's less than 10% of their student body is Pell eligible. Kentucky in the Commonwealth, we are a, uh, not a rich state yet. So it's not surprising that the two R1s have more, the University of Kentucky and University of Louisville. UK has about 20% of their student body is Pell eligible. But the University of Louisville, this was actually what drew me to this place. What really fascinated me is that we are an R1 university which has about 
percent of our students as Pell eligible. Please keep that in mind because it shows you the scale of the transformation we are able to engage in. And when I came here, even though it was still very early in my tenure, I told you that I believe we need to keep things simple to move big organizations. I talked to you about my vision that we should be a great place to learn, a great place to work, and a great place to invest. I also told you that we would do all that because we would celebrate diversity, we would foster equity, and we would strive for inclusion. So let me give you a very quick update on each of these, how things have gone in the past two and a half years. So fall 2020, as I told you, I made this big presentation to our board of trustees, to our president's council, and to the council on post-secondary education. And I was able to share, this is all because of my team. This is not about an individual taking credit. It truly is team effort, but this is to uplift them. That despite the big crises of 2020, we've had some big wins. That doesn't mean we don't have challenges. We have many, but as you know, when you're leading in a time of crisis, you've got to pause and celebrate the team whenever you can. So for fall 2020, the University of Louisville, despite the pandemic, had the highest enrollment growth of any public university or college in Kentucky. So we're very proud of that. We bucked the national trend of double digit dips and we grew our freshmen by a little over two and a half percent. So I'm very, very uh, pleased with that. We also achieved our highest six year graduation in our record. Now that's still not enough. We have to do a lot more, but we are committed. We are moving in the right direction. Many of you know that we had to pivot. We were the first to say within four days, we took our entire coursework online in spring semester. But because of the 40% Pell eligible population, I told you, we knew that for many of these students, we are their best home. If we just shut down, they would not be safe. So we actually throughout the spring semester took care of about 2,700 students. We kept dining open, we kept housing open, we kept the libraries open. So that's what we had to do. And we have tremendous faculty and staff, and I'm so grateful to them for everything they did to really move the LEARN uh, mission forward. In terms of being a great place to work, we've made commitments. One of the commitments was to an employee success center. And I'm so glad Brian Buford that many of you know, uh, and is just a superstar, is heading up that for us in terms of our employee success center. We, I'm also pleased, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, we'll validate and talk about it internally more. This is more for you as Rotarians. Uh, this is the part that uh, I'm very pleased about. There's a survey that comes out of uh, Harvard where they will survey your entire faculty and on a number of dimensions. And I was very gratified. Uh, then they provide you ratings uh, relative to your peers. And it's a good sign. There's still a lot more to go, but I was very pleased that a strength that was pointed out for the University of Louisville is that there's trust in senior leadership. So that's not just me, it's my cadre that works alongside me, but that's again a good sign that we're moving in the right direction. I also told you that we would be a great place to invest. And at the time that I talked to you and later as we kept thinking about this, I promised that we would have one a front door to the university. So any business, anybody, any of you that says, I want to mentor, I want to help, I want to support, what can I do to be engaged? We just hired David Kalzi. I am hoping that many of you know David and he's been um, obviously someone who cares deeply about Louisville and I'm delighted. So you can just reach out to Dave, uh, reach out to me and uh, we have an easy way now to help you navigate the University of Louisville. Other things we've done to make ourselves a great place in which to invest. Our research, our research expenditures this past year, that's important. We desperately need support for research 
because competition to be an R1 is very great. And if we get kicked out of that group, getting back in is impossible. So the support for research is also vital. And we had a record year ever in terms of research last year. Some of the really cool things that are happening in research, I won't go through too much because you have to guide me on what you want me to talk more about. Uh, the co-immunity project. I hope you are all aware of that. The wastewater testing that's coming out of the University of Louisville. Uh, Q Griffithson the, uh, and Dr. Pal Paula Bates's work and Dr. Ken Palmer's work got a lot of publicity. I don't know if you saw a way of stopping cancer cells from growing. And then they took and applied the technology for the coronavirus. And right now, along with the Department of Defense, the National Cancer Institute, University of Louisville and the University of Pittsburgh is working on this. It's going to be a game changer uh, because vaccinations can be nasal sprays instead of the traditional vaccine. There's some really interesting uh, work that is uh, going on. I'm also very proud of our school uh, schools across the university that are engaged in everything from youth violence prevention to um, we have a project on uh, Sharon Carrick, the one and only Sharon Carrick, we're so proud of her, uh, is leading the Center for Digital Transformation. We want, got a, an award from the NSA, that's big deal people, to uh, train cybersecurity professionals in healthcare. So we focused on healthcare. This, the first round, it was a highly competitive pro process, over 150 universities competing, but we are a cybersecurity center of excellence. So we have a $6 million grant to uh, first coach uh, veterans and first responders to, uh, to be retooled if they wanted to or career advancement to go into um, healthcare cybersecurity. Uh, other things that I want to talk to you about is work at our foundation. When David Grissom hired me as chair and Mary Nixon as my current board chair, we've always said we need to make sure that everybody has great trust in the University of Louisville as a great place in which to invest. So I'm proud to tell you that good work by Earl Reed as foundation chair, Keith Sherman as the director of this, we have done something that to my knowledge, I'm not aware of other universities that do it. It doesn't mean they don't exist. I'm just telling you that I am not aware. I've been looking for it. Many of you know that we knew we had to turn around. And so at the University of Louisville, what we did is when somebody makes a donation to us now, uh, you can log in. We give you ability to log in and monitor your own accounts. You call us, of course, we produce reports, but you can see at any given time, market value, book value, how things are being used. So I'm very proud of that, that level of transparency that we're setting up. Last point um, is diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is a passion of mine. And when we talk about leading through crisis, I know that you all remember the first year for me was financial. We needed to increase our liquidity, get accreditation. Year two was all about healthcare. I am so grateful that our board supported this vision and the state supported our vision of saving healthcare in this community. During COVID-19, we did the testing for eight hospitals, not just for UFL Health, Baptist, Norton, as well as uh, other hospitals in Indiana and in, in the Commonwealth. So the fact that we were able to preserve Jewish hospital and take care of people uh, during the pandemic is something that we are extremely grateful for. That matters because as you know, it's a safety net hospital and it would have had a disproportionate impact on uh, the most vulnerable in our, in our population. Lastly, for diversity, equity and inclusion. This was something even when I was interviewing, I told people I'm passionate about and it was welcomed by my board. So you may think that our focus on this is more recent after the urgent cries for social justice over the summer. But the truth is we signed on and said, 
we would be anti-racist a year and a half ago. So CEO Action, I encourage all of you to look up the site, ceoaction.com. Um, CEO and if you look at it, you'll see Tim Ryan from PwC and so many other leaders who've signed on to it and said, we need to be uh, creating a more equitable society. I am a business person. I was Dean of a business school. I am proud. I talk about the nobility of business. And so I said, universities and colleges talk a good game. I know that, but I'm telling you, we often lag behind what business is doing. So I signed us up on that pledge and my entire senior leadership team took that pledge. And you may have seen, we have said, we will be a premier metropolitan research university. That was the goal that was set for us by the General Assembly, but that we would be a premier anti-racist metropolitan research university. For many of you, you might wonder, what does that mean? I want to demystify it for you. Racism is a very simple thought that a whole group of people is inherently inferior or superior just because of the color of their skin. What folly, right? So anti-racism is the equally simple idea that no person is inherently inferior or superior just because of the color of their skin. So we call it CARA, the Cardinal Anti-Racist Agenda, and we are determined that we won't be left behind. The Procter and Gamble's of the world can do it. We are not going to be left behind. We at the University of Louisville believe in creating vital ecosystems where everybody can thrive. And I do this because the success of the university matters to Louisville. Did you see my adornment here? I do remember this always, that the University of Louisville is critical to the city of Louisville and Louisville is critical to the Commonwealth. So all of our impact is ripple effects. We hope that what we do has good impacts. And I'm gonna pause here because I, last time I talked to you all about service. I will pause with this last sentence and then hopefully you have questions for me. When I think about leading and leadership, I tell, when I teach classes on this, I tell people, it's easy to know if you're a manager. All you have to do is look at your org chart and see if people are reporting to you. It's much harder to know if you're a leader. You need to look behind you and see, is anybody bothering to follow me? Because you see, managers are appointed from above, but leaders are anointed by their followers. And so I have a lot to say and think about how we look at teams, how we look at leadership, how we take care of ourselves during a crisis and pandemic, but I'm happy to answer any questions. I hope this was helpful. I just wanted you to see what is happening at the university. I feel like I'm reporting back to you. All right. Um, yes, is there a plan to constantly raise the academic standards and results that will raise the academic rating of the university? Uh, Judy, thank you for that question, absolutely. The issue here though is uh, what we are doing is making sure when people graduate on time and what happens after. Absolutely, we are working on it. And if you see, we've made great strides in uh, removing the barriers for our underrepresented students or low income students, making sure that everybody succeeds. And I get your point. It's really about academic excellence that we are truly committed to. But one of the things I do want to point out to you is I think that's terrific, but we don't stop there. If you honestly think about it, we need to start monitoring what happens to students after they graduate, right? Because I still remember when I was Dean of a business school, uh, a parent came up to me and said, Neely, this is great but I don't care with my, whether my kid has BBA or MBA after their name, the three letters I want to see are J-O-B, you know? So that's important. So we are committed. 
we now have students, we've raised our academic standards where clearly economics plays a part. I'm not gonna deny that. Where, but I'm able to show them data that if they stay here and go to a great public research university, their odds of getting into an Ivy League graduate program are greater. So right now we have people who've turned down Brown and Columbia and I can go on and on and are staying here and they are going on to do extraordinary things. Um, uh, Fred, can you unmute and ask your question of Dr. Neely? Fred Cowan, I think. Can, can, can you unmute Fred? No. I have a, okay. I have a question. Dr. Okay. okay, do you hear me now? Yes, Fred, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry, I lost my internet connection. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, you should call me Neely, Fred. <laughs> okay, Neely, Dr. Uh, Neely, <laughs> thank you very much for your uh, great uh, talk and your uh, leadership for our, our university. Um, my question is, it's a similar question I asked many years ago, uh, I think uh, President Ramsey and others. We know and you, of all people, know that state support for your budget and for almost all university budgets has dropped uh, significantly in the last 30, 40 years to the point where it's only a small percentage of your overall budget. And uh, at the same time, tuition costs have gone up quite a bit. But uh, my question to you is, in terms of the University of Louisville specifically, uh, do you have any plans for how the university can significantly increase its overall standing in the university community nationwide and its particular impact on our city and our state uh, without uh, getting a lot more state funds? Uh, thank you so much. And I did not plan that question. I'm really glad you asked that. People are surprised. We're a state university, but we really do rely on private support a great deal. So if, I, if you were to guess what percentage of my budget, I'm just talking on the academic side. We have about 1.2 billion on our academic side. I'm not even talking about the health sciences. So in the university side, about 10% of our budget comes from the state. So that puts an enormous pressure in fact, if you see uh, what's happening to cost of attendance, you are right. What's happening is as the state's role goes down, more of that is being picked up by the student. I am happy to tell you though, this is important for you to know. Uh, the data that just came out shows uh, that of all uh, public universities and colleges in the, in the Commonwealth, our graduates graduate with the lowest college debt. So we work really hard to provide need-based aid, to provide internship opportunities, et cetera. I need your help in telling the story of UFL more. Uh, we are going to be doing uh, some work on branding, telling our story, but I'm so grateful you gave me this opportunity. All of you heard about the Pfizer vaccine, yes? How many of you knew that the only center for excellence in infectious diseases for the, for the North American continent, Pfizer's only center for excellence on infectious diseases started at the University of Louisville last year. So these are the things that I look for your ideas, please help. Because if more people knew, and in fact, you can see now that you cannot have a thriving research center, uh, I mean, sorry, thriving city anywhere, without a thriving research university. I love Tori McClure. She's my shero, I will just tell you, uh, Susan Donovan. So every college has a role and uh, uh, tie with our Jefferson. I'm not saying there's not a role for each of them. We're all an ecosystem, but the reality is you cannot have a thriving city without a thriving research university. And I want your help. How do I tell this story more about Pfizer and and in fact, that's the only center they'll have in North America is here. So anyway, that's, those are some of the things that I have to work on. I honestly thought I'd be doing that uh, this year because after last summer, last year in early spring, I said, shoo, this has been two years nonstop. 
I'm going to take a breather over the summer, think about how, to, how we get the message out. And then, of course, the pandemic hit and we are all, I'm very proud of our students. You know that we've kept, uh, uh, kept it open. They're masking, practicing social distancing, all of that. Jean, did you have a question as well? Jean West? Uh, you're muted, Jean. Um, I think she, she's having a um, tough time. I uh, wonder if you would consider having a permanent pay. I, yes, I'm, hi, I'm Jean. Muted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Would you would you consider having a permanent paying member, Rotary member, to represent the university? We could use your input in uh, many of the service projects that we were doing, and we can work together to to uh, you know lift the university as well. Uh, Jasmine Ferrier, who heads up our advancement, is going to be a permanent member on Rotary. Is that what you're asking? Someone from the university to be? Yes. She yes. is a paying member, and I know you will love working with her. Uh, she has, is an incredible professor at UFL and heads up advancement for us. I'm sorry, tell me that name again. Jasmine Farrier. See, she's a good incoming president. She's already taking notes. It's good. <laughs> yes, she's, she's on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it is so true, though, to have that great partnership. We just really appreciate that. So this question is from Tracy Holliday. Um, he asked, what are the six year graduation rates and how do they compare nationally? Excellent question. So this may surprise all of you that we look at six year graduation rates. And if you look at who gets to 70%, that's the holy grail. If you get to 70%, that's you're in a league with the Ivies. I'm not saying that's good, but that's sad. It's actually a very, very small percentage. We, we got a very nice bump and now we're at 60%. I am not satisfied. You know me, if you know me even a little bit, you know, I promise you that we will have a stretch goal and we will get there. We really ought to get to 70%. Now that's not easy. We're talking about very few universities are able to get there, but I think we can. The biggest obstacle for me, every university is unique. For me, because our Pell eligible population is so great, small emergency grants. That's the key for us. I'm so grateful. Randy Bufford and uh, Mary Gwen Wheeler, David Jones Jr., Nitin Sani, so many people who've stepped up, seen this gap for us and given us funding for it. That's the sad part, Tracy, because when you have first generation low income, oh, I've got to brag on one thing. I've got to, sorry, uh, because it's a quiz. Uh, of the 101 top most selective public universities in the country. Obviously, we're in that group. How many do you think have more than 10% Black students in their student body? Julie and Jean, you two have to play along. Just take a guess. Five. Julie, Seven. what do you say? Seven. Seven. It's two. The University of Louisville is one of them. That's it. There are two. UFL and uh, SUNY, uh, uh, Albany are the other ones. And in fact, only three universities get an A in access to both Black and Latinx students. And don't worry people, if you hear Latinx, it's just Latino, Latina. Universities, we love using these words, it's just demystify it. But seriously, only three have an A. And you, your University of Louisville is one of them. Us and University of Maine, for black students because it's are you more than the proportion in the state and then us in new mexico for latino latina students so that's a desperate need for us because when people have a car breakdown they'll drop out of school because they don't know how to find the couple hundred dollars to fix that and they don't have the social capital either people that they can go to who can say my uncle and aunt or someone else can help so that's the one thing that i need in your chat box, it's all about building a team. I, I'm uh, starting to assemble my own team and uh, Lieutenant Colonel retired, Marnock is, my goodness, do not mess with the Lieutenant Colonel, I tell you. <laughs> so she is my executive officer and she's posting the links to um, some of the, the uh, material I'm referencing. 
because in God we trust, everybody else bring data. So everything I've said to you, we can back up with data. Well, I can't tell you how inspiring you are and how much we appreciate your bold leadership. And I just wanna ask, are there another, is there another Rotarian that would like to ask the last question of Dr. Neely? I believe Abby Drain. Abby, did you have something or? These Zoom calls can be kind of awkward. Thank you everyone for your patience. If not, uh, may I conclude with one thing, Julie? Sure. Um, I like, I, I'm a teacher at heart. So to me, there has to be some solid takeaway for each of you. Um, and I, I'm often asked, how do I think about putting teams together? So I'd like to share my philosophy with you. Uh, there's not one right answer, but every team, I try to think of one or more people who are excellent diagnosticians, okay? They love the statistics. They like to diagnose the problem. Mm -hmm. And on every team, I like to have one or more people who can take all of that and craft a vision and say, this is where we are going. But you cannot stop with those two. You also need on the senior leadership team, people who can intervene skillfully. Because when you begin to implement, uh, no plan survives the first touch with reality, right? So first contact. So people who can intervene skillfully. So each of you as incredible leaders, I know that it's no longer solo. It is about working as a team. Hopefully uh, you'll ask yourself, or if it's just you, that a portion of your time should be spent on problem solving, uh, identifying the problem, a portion on crafting the vision, and some portion on making sure that you continue to intervene skillfully. So hopefully that's something that's even semi-useful to all of you. I appreciate you. I'm grateful for you. I was unnecessarily nervous speaking to you because you are my peeps. You know, this is Rotary. I belong here. So thank you. Oh, thank you so very, very much. And thank you again for your bold and visionary leadership and for your enthusiasm and for your heartfelt desire to help all people in our community to lift everyone. So just thank you so very much. You know, as you said, the University of Louisville's interconnected role of success for our region and state, well, it just cannot be overstated. So thank you again so very much. And if we can ever do anything for you at the Rotary Club, please let us know. We appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so next week's meeting will be Closing the Digital Divide. It'll be led by Rob Morfanius, who is CEO of Kentucky Wired, and Dave Flesses, CEO of Excelicom. And reminder, register for the special Business Synergy event, February the 9th, Cook Along with Chef Fredot. And for those that are interested, please stay on the line for What is Rotary that will follow immediately after the meeting. Thank you all for being here. Be well, and we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>